um, homeopathy and AIDS in Africa. So that's where my experience is. And uh, that's what I will discuss. Um, this, this originates from the work of Peter Chappell, sitting over there. Peter, perhaps you want to stand up for a moment? A hand is not enough, Peter. Um, the remedy, PC1, Peter Chapel 1, he had to give it a name, uh, was something he designed in 2002. Actually, he went to Ethiopia already in 2001, and later, when we started to work together, we um, founded this organization, AMA Resonance Healing Foundation, to promote this kind of work for Africa. An important remark here is that for the choice of a homeopathic remedy, um, this is based on the selection of symptoms, not on the diagnosis or on the hypothesis of what this diagnosis is about. So in terms of HIV, to be or not to be HIV, to the homeopath is not a question. Of course it has ramifications in terms of how you interpret, interpret things, but in terms of selecting a remedy that can be successful, you don't need to have that paradigm because you just prescribe on the symptoms that the organism is producing. Samuel Hahnemann is, is our guru, you might say. Started homeopathy some two ages ago. Um, with AIDS, there are some medical commandments. Thou shalt not consider anything other cause of AIDS besides HIV. Has been properly discussed already today. Thou shalt not consider any other cure for AIDS besides HIV. And then, which is more coming closer to homeopathy, thou shalt worship, worship suppression as the one and only true method of healing. And if suppression leads to therapy resistance, the conclusion is we need to suppress more severely. And if it leads to immune deficiency and a weaker immune system, it means we need to suppress on a continued basis. And uh, for homeopathy, that is a complete opposite way of going about cure. There has been this whole discussion, and I don't think we should enter into that because we can spend the whole day on that. Does homeop homeopathy work, yes or no? Is it possible? Is it possible to work with substances that have been diluted so much that at some point there is no ingredient anymore to be found statistically? Um, Lord Kelvin, certainly a researcher we still all know, and we would like to have it a little, a couple of degrees Kelvin lower here, um, if we could, said that heavier than air flying machines are impossible. So there have been stated more things impossible in the past and proven otherwise later on. The basis of homeopathy Similiac similibus curento, or like cures like, or resonance, is built on the idea that a substance that can induce symptoms in a healthy individual can be used as a healing substance to treat the same symptoms in a diseased person. The only thing is that if you do it with the crude substance, you will just increase the situation. Uh, so if you, for instance, you have a intoxication, uh, or you have symptoms that look like an intoxication of arsenicum, uh, arsenide, uh, with vomiting and diarrhea and a whole lot, and you would give the patient pure arsen arsenide, you would just make it worse. But if you take very low doses, then the opposite uh, happens, and you get a healing response of the organism as if it has been poisoned with arsenide. That's the basic idea. And another important thing that Hahnemann already concluded from his work is that when you only suppress symptoms, and that includes homeopathy, if you would prescribe on a very superficial basis and only suppress symptoms, on the long term, what you create is actually chronicity of the state. So you see a short-term success, and on the long, long term, you get more and more chronic problems and more severe problems. Usually speaking, in treating 
a patient coming to a homeopath, a homeopath will look at all those symptoms that are peculiar to the patient and will ignore those symptoms which are typical for the disease because these are the same in everyone. Uh, so in those conditions that kind of come out of the constitution of an individual, uh, constitutional problems you could call them, um, you look at those things that are peculiar to the patient because that is what makes this patient a different one from another and you prescribe on those. There's only one exception to this rule and that is in epidemics. In epidemics you have to do with a condition which is not coming from the constitution which is not so much related to the individual and how the individual lives his life but has more to do with circumstances and that can be an infection, that can be other kind of circumstances and, in, and I'd like to say here that the word epidemic doesn't necessarily have to be restricted to just infections but actually any state that has to do with that has a collective nature and has to do with circumstances so this could also be like an earthquake or a tsunami but also an, ep uh, an epidemic disease in those cases you can actually treat every patient with one and the same remedy as long as you find a remedy that kind of covers the totality of the disease. And that's where homeopaths use the as if per one person approach for. You take a number of cases suffering from the same disease, you collect all the symptoms, each patient is expressing different symptoms of them, and th on that totality you prescribe a remedy that in principle could fit everyone. Sometimes homeopaths find three or four and have to deselect, select for every patient, but at, at least it narrows it down for, from say 3,000 remedies to three, four or five. Ideally one. The history with treating epidemics in homeopathy is just stunning. If you look at the reports of say a century ago and longer, when there were several homeopathic hospitals in Europe, but also in the US, the US had dozens of homeopathic hospitals, homeopaths were treating diseases like cholera with a lot of success. With cholera, you would lose with uh, regular medicine some 40% of the patients. Homeopaths would lose some 4%. With yellow fever in the US, 55% of the patients would die whereas in homeopathic hospitals that was something like 5%. And it was even so that based on these results, even people that were opposing homeopathy had to kind of advise the US government to use homeopathy for these kind of diseases because the successes could not be denied. Also with the Spanish flu, which was an avian flu as we know now, homeopaths were losing something like 10% of the patients that were being lost uh, in other hospitals. And this is based on like numbers of 20, 40,000 patients. And this is not small figures. Huge results. Then when regular medicine as we know it now started to develop and pharmaceutical companies started to flourish and new medicines were being created, antibiotics were started, um, homeopathy kind of went into a decline and it looked as if modern medicine would be able to kind of tackle all of these problems in the coming age, the past one. So it's only since a couple of decades that homeopathy started to flourish again and mainly on the level of chronic diseases. Um, I think this is the last biblical <laughs> sentence that I will use. Um, as, thou sow, as you sow, so shall you reap. Um, this is actually what's happening in regular medicine, that when you suppress diseases, when you suppress infectious diseases, what you create is therapy resistance. What you recreate is increased virulence of the bacteria or the viruses that you have to deal with. And so in a way it is a a street that is kind of ending at some point because how, how can you continue suppressing, suppressing, suppressing and get more and more severe situations. So 
based on history alone, homeopathy, I think, deserves to be considered for treating epidemics, for treating AIDS, for treating collective diseases, at least. It's, I think it's the thing we do best. Because when you go to a homeopath for a chronic disease, you depend a lot on the qualities of this homeopath to get the essential information out of you and to interpret it and analyze it properly and find that remedy that can help you. Whereas based on an as if one person analysis, a remedy has been identified that is successful, anyone can prescribe it. Which was quite fascinating for me to, to realize after having done homeopathy for 20 years and working so hard to find that one remedy that it's so easy to treat AIDS. And why should homeopathy be considered? It's completely safe, cannot have side effects, very cheap, no therapy resistance, no increased violence, has been effective in the past, and as I will show you, is effective now. This is the kind of picture that uh, we were confronted with, like all of you, in Africa. Supposedly, so many people infected with HIV, supposedly so many children, HIV positive, 2 million deaths a year, 50 million AIDS orphans by now. Um, and whether or not it's HIV or not, and whether the numbers are less, we're still talking about millions. And if you go to Africa like Peter has done and like I have done, you find devastating situations. Uh, so it's certainly serious. However, we interpret it and understand it. It's a huge problem there. So even if HIV equals AIDS is true, ARVs don't cure. They are not available in many places. They give drug resistance, they give side effects. I mean, I've seen side effects in just a small village where three people were completely paralyzed due to the use of ARVs. I mean, if, if in the whole world, one homeopath would paralyze one patient with a homeopathic remedy, I'm sure the whole of homeopathy would be forbidden soon, easily. Second line treatment, forget about it in Africa. And then there is, as we know, the dual epidemic with TB. So Peter went to Ethiopia in 2001 just to see whether homeopathy had anything to offer to AIDS patients in Africa. Would it be possible? He didn't know, he just wanted to see what he could do. So he went to Ethiopia, I think in one of the suburbs where the, those people live that don't get any help, uh, don't get any help anywhere. And just to sum it up, what he started to do is just individualize the cases. You see the patient, take the symptoms, prescribe a remedy, fitting them. And what he found is that in most cases, this was effective, but not in all of the cases. But even if it would be effective in all of the cases, you cannot individualize in Africa each and every AIDS patient. Because first of all, there are just a handful of homeopaths available in Africa. There, there are millions of people that could use the treatment. So a different disease-specific approach would be needed based on this principle that I discussed with you before, the genus epidemicus. Which in a way is, is combining the advantages of homeopathy, which is non-toxic, with the advantages of regular medicine, and that is where diagnosis is cure. If the diagnosis is AIDS, you can give the remedy. We don't need to discuss all the symptoms, I think. Um, this is just a very short summary of it. Peter took 70 cases, took all their symptoms together, took out all those symptoms which were more typical to the patient, and remained those symptoms that were general and had to do with AIDS. And based on that uh, general picture, um, he made an analysis and looked in what we call the Materia Medica, which is a kind of room full of books, um, including descriptions of all the remedies that we know. And he couldn't select one remedy that he felt was sufficiently fitting the totality. Um, I remember I'm, I'm the editor of a, of a journal that around that time Peter was writing to me, there was already email writing to me and can you help? And so we send out this message to other homeopaths, this is the totality of the symptoms, 
any good suggestions are very welcome. And there wasn't one good suggestion coming in. Now, what you must understand is to, to get to know a remedy picture in homeopathy takes a lot of time. You have to do what we call approving, which means that volunteers take a remedy in a homeopathic dose, uh, write down all the symptoms they notice, based on that there is a totality, then you have to try it out in practice, etc., etc. And beforehand you don't know what the picture will be. Sometimes you can have an idea if there is a kind of toxic picture already available of the remedy, but very often you don't know. So to just look by testing more remedies and find one for HIV AIDS, this could take decades. And at that time Peter uh, thought I need to find another way to get around this problem and so what he did then is discover a way of imprinting actually healing information into water directly. So instead of using a substance and kind of understand what this substance is about and then prescribe it to patients, um, he said I already know what I want to prescribe, I have the symptom totality, I have the understanding of the disease, but how to get this understanding into a bottle so I can give it to a patient. That is very shortly what it's about. Um, the rights of this whole process, he donated to the foundation, so this, this is not about uh, money or whatever. Peter just gen generously gave that to the foundation, so it can be used for the, to the benefit of patients in Africa. I remember Peter writing around that time when the first patients came back to him. And I think he, sa he wrote something like, I made a jive, which is something I never do. Because to his amazement, people were doing very well, extremely well. Uh, in terms of returned appetite, returned strength, um, no more pains, no more cough, increased weight, um, going back to schools, going back to their work, people were just actually healing in, in, in a matter of days or weeks which is as fabulous, and I agree with Juliana that the, the ability of the Af African people to respond and to kind of uh, get back to their health is a lot better than what we see in the West. And there are many reasons for that, and I don't think we need to discuss this here. Anyway, these were the results that he saw, and which were quite amazing. So he realized that his word wouldn't be just taken for it, so he already started to kind of objectify his results, um, starting to use scores, Karnofsky score you might know, which is a validated system to measure the general state of health. And what he saw is that in a group of 95 patients, this increased from 43 to 77, which means is from frequently needing support and being disabled to be able to look after themselves and having only moderate symptoms. When people finish their treatment, and I th if I'm wrong, Peter, you just say so, but I, I assume you just gave them one bottle and you, they use it for six to 12 weeks or something like that. If they finish the bottle, that's when Peter started to take CD4s. So he took the CD4 when the treatment was finished and measured it again 10 weeks later and saw that the CD4 was rising even when he stopped treatment, meaning that the people themselves had found their way back to health. Uh, so the body was still restoring. At some point, I think it was 2003 or early 2004, I don't know, there was a conference where uh, Peter was one of the speakers and more so there was another case that really, I mean, that hit me like lightning. Uh, there was a case shown by an, a homeopath of an HIV positive uh, gay person and this man came to the homeopath, not so much because he was HIV positive, but because he was heavily depressed. And the bottom line was that he felt nobody will ever love me, nobody will ever love me, and there's only one logical thing that I could do in life, and that is just kill myself. And the homeopath had, path had desperately tried to treat this man with all kinds of homeopathic remedies unsuccessfully. And then at the end he thought, well, if I can't help him with a depression, pr perhaps I can do something about preventing him to get into severe stages of AIDS. So he prescribed him this remedy, PC-1. 
And this was the most dramatic case I've ever seen, and there were several follow-ups on video of this patient. This man had a complete transformation, and in tears, weepingly told how after this remedy, there was a lot of changes inside of himself, and it came down to that he said, I love everyone. It's phenomenal. I love everyone. He wasn't talking about whether other people were loving him. He was so full of love that this whole problem with other people loving him, yes or no, no longer existed. He had enough love for himself and everyone else. That case made me realize that this remedy, PC1, perhaps might not only cover the symptoms and uh, palliate patients or treat them properly, but might touch on something which might have to do with something like the root of HIV AIDS or AIDS without HIV, but that it had to do perhaps with the root of AIDS. And that this, this individual patient just happened to be in a state which kind of uh, resonated with what AIDS is about. Anyway, for me it was a reason to ask Peter, is there a place in Africa where you've been long enough that I could go there and uh, interview patients and retrospectively see how they are doing. And so that's when, together with a colleague, I went to Malawi and visited Jacqueline Kauenhoven and John Fox, who are running a wonderful center in Malawi. On the left, you see the medical units. They have a unit for homeop homeopathy, they have a unit for AIDS patients, they have a unit for regular medicine, they have a unit for traditional medicine. Patients can just choose as they like. Um, so we went up to Malawi, interviewed some 60 patients, and luckily enough, Peter had already started using a standard way of interviewing them and noting down their symptoms, so we could compare. And this is just one of the cases I can share, which was just amazing. This was a woman that was hospitalized, weighing 25 kilos. Um, in a ward where she said everyone was dying. And there was, the, her relatives heard about this remedy, brought her the bottle, and she said, I was the only one released from this ward, this TB ward. Um, and when we saw her, she was weighing 52 kilos, was completely well, and kicked her husband out. Because she confronted him and she said, well listen, I've got AIDS due to you, so either you stop going to prostitutes and have only protected sex with me, or you leave. And that was the end of it. I thought that was a sign of health. This was another one of those 60 cases we saw. A lady that was pregnant and already beyond in the second half of pregnancy was only weighing 40 kilos. Having a baby inside of herself, weak, no appetite, pains, the regular symptoms you find with AIDS. 2PC1. And when we saw her, she had a healthy baby, had no symptoms herself. And I remember that at some point, we also started treating new patients and saw those back. I said to my colleague, Cory, I said, this is crazy, but it's easier to treat, treat AIDS in Africa than a running nose in Holland. It, it was just amazing for me to, that this was possible. Um, these are the parameters that we were able to check um, and weight being probably the most objective of them. What was also quite interesting, five minutes? Really? There are different minutes. Okay. Um, malaria was quite interesting because malaria was very low in those patients since they started taking it. And they didn't get anything for malaria, they just had the remedy for AIDS. And what I did, I, I checked the records um, in the area because I thought perhaps it's a seasonal thing. And what I found out was that actually in the months that these patients had a, a huge drop of malaria, in the region malaria was on the rise because it was a season for it. So that was quite significant as well. Um, I need to kind of s sum it up. So we've got reports from all kinds of places. This is India. We've got reports from several African countries. Um, 
Peter has been in several countries. I've been in several Africa, African countries myself, and many colleagues have been using this remedy now. Um, and so, actually, we, we got feedback, say, of, of thousands of patients on how they are doing. A report from Rwanda with completely normalized CD4s, uh, a study with 10 patients, again, seeing the CD4s rise in a short amount of time. Um, and this has been, oh, sorry. A report from Rwanda again, where they could also objectify some CD4s that were statistically significantly increased. And so, all in all, what we see is that patients, normally speaking, improve in a matter of days or weeks, and all we provide is just this remedy, which is based on giving information to the system on how to heal itself. There are those cases that sometimes do not respond as we would like them to respond, and usually those cases are the ones that do not have proper food. If we then provide food as well, they're fine. So food, it's, what you could say is that like what, what Juliana discussed, is you bring all kinds of materials to a, a place to kind of restore a building. And all these materials are needed. But what is also needed is a kind of building plan. And that is something that a homeopathic remedy can restore. And then the, the body is able to amazingly uh, cure itself, actually, even with what we would call bad nutrition. Uh, like most of Africa, they just eat maize, 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 and maize. And, and they wouldn't want anything else. Uh, but nevertheless, they're able usually to uh, restore their health very well. The increase in, ways, in weight, opportunistic infections disappear, um, malaria, TB subsides, return to work and school, etc. And usually speaking, one bottle is enough. We went to the Central African Republic with the intention to do a study. Uh, Klaus Schusterede is the second to the left an Austrian doctor who worked in the country for two years, and you must know, not in the city, but in the bush, without running water, without electricity, doing homeopathy, but also doing operations, running a, running a, a, a hospital, doing cesareans and birth, and the whole lot. So he, he had a wealth of experience to us, and the Minister of Health around that time, the lady on your right, visited him in the hospital, spoke to the patients and came up to him and say, what are you doing with the AIDS patients? Because the people are talking about it very positively. So that's when we were invited to come over and meet the, the prime minister and discuss uh, a study, which being Africa ultimately didn't completely succeed. Um, these are some, some other uh, cases that we treated at that point, and I don't think they say anything else than what we already discussed. This is a comparison before and after treatment. Um, interesting feedback also, a lady that came up to us, brought by a taxi, and I mean, a taxi is expensive for an African. I mean, that's a lot of money. Four days later, she came walking four or five kilometers to save the money because she had already improved that much. All of these patients were, were complaining of hunger. And Peter has, has even had the experience that people sometimes stopped the treatment because they couldn't afford the food that they now would like to eat. Uh, so many AIDS patients in Africa, what you see is that they have no more appetite. And when they start to, to get well, of course, the body asks for, give me the material to build myself up. So they get hungry. And sometimes they have stopped treatment because of the hunger. Yeah. This is, um, there's more to, to be done. Huh? I think we need all approaches in Africa to kind of work together. Uh, we were about to work with the Institut Pasteur and then during the study, their machines broke down and they didn't save the blood and so we couldn't do CD4s and all of that. But what we did see is a similar result as what I had already seen in Malawi, that all the parameters that you can clinically measure um, had improved. 
with the exception of Carposi sarcoma. There was still the same number after those 46 days. Malawi is the place where we have the longest follow-up. Um, according to John Fox, he says those that, that have safe sex only needed one bottle and that's it, and they're fine. That's his word. I'm, I don't know. I mean, he can't follow all these people and, and check whether they have safe sex only or whatever, but that's his impression. Um, a doctor from a hospital that at that time assisted Peter in treating the patients say, said the people that were treated then I still see walking around. They needed a bottle once and they're still fine. What we were very happy to find out is that uh, people that are on ARVs, and these have been pushed in Malawi and many other countries since 2007, that those people that are on ARVs and have side effects of them, if they take PC1 alongside, the side effects subside. So somehow, it seems to be possible to kind of um, improve the body's ability to deal with these toxins. We haven't been, been kind of challenging the whole HIV paradigm because homeopathy is controversial by itself enough. And to, uh, so we, we kind of silently have done the work that we could do in Africa where we could without challenging that um, and just treat the patients as they come. But one of the problems is that even p patients that are doing well are sometimes kind of forced to stop homeopathic treatment or kind of persuaded to nevertheless take ARVs, although they're doing well. Is it only success? No, the lady that well, I showed you first in Malawi ultimately died. She went back to her husband. Uh, that's the story. She went back to the husband. The husband kept seeing prostitutes. And whether that's a correlation there or not, I don't know. But that's the story we got. The other lady was well for four years on one bottle of, of the medicine. Uh, and then started to get symptoms back. And as she knew, ARVs are, are available now and you should use these. She went to the hospital, got them, was never well since. Um, so we restarted her on PC1 while we were there. This is one of the ways that we kind of try to see what's inside this remedy. And you might know the word of work of Masuro Emoto fascinating work on water and the ability of water to contain information. And they made some beautiful pictures of the PC1 remedies. As you can see, we have a male and a female remedy because if you analyze the situation of male and female with AIDS within the way it's being understood in Africa, there's quite a big difference between being a woman or a man in uh, the implications for you. Uh, for instance, the usual story is the man already died, never wanted to go to a doctor because there's a big taboo on having AIDS, so they didn't have AIDS and they just died. Um, the woman <laughs> feeling... I don't know what you mean with that. But, yeah. um, and uh, the woman feeling responsible for the children ultimately did come with her symptoms and asked for treatment. That's, that's what we generally saw. I'll skip this. This is a homeopathic proving of the remedy. There have been other approaches tested with homeopathy. Barbara Brewitt has uh, used one method. Um, this is Dana Ullman who uh, reviewed a couple of tests done and came to the conclusion that Homeopathy should at least be adjunctive or even an alternative therapy for AIDS. Aquilae is another remedy being tested with good results. Combination of homeopathy and nutrition would be more ideal, actually, if you can, if you can uh, take care of that. Some of the complicating factors, safe sex is a challenge, if it is a factor at all. Um, patient compliance, co problematic in Africa. Food supply, problematic. AFEs being pushed. Homeopathy, hardly available. South Africa, a bit, but the rest of Africa, hardly. Um, due to 
the South African upheaval around alternative medicine and AIDS, um, any approach has been very strongly uh, seen in a negative way now. So in South Africa, you don't need to discuss it even. Not easy to perform a study in Africa, so we've kind of decided and hope to be able to do it in, in India, where the conditions are better, and home homeopathy is kind of institutional. Um, and there is, of course, always a lack of funds. How are we doing time-wise? Uh, yeah. Really? Okay. Well, I'm I'm fine to stop. Ah. Okay. So, just as a last thing then, even if HIV is not the cause of HIV AIDS, then still, I think AIDS has promoted the ex acceptance of homo homosex homosexuality, has been questioning tribal taboos in Africa, teaching African women to say no, promoting equality of sexes in Africa, placing ra rape in Africa on the agenda, and that is huge in some areas, really huge, and is awakening wonderful qualities in lots of people. We remember the buddies uh, in the US and Europe, the hospitals that I've seen in South Africa, for instance, the orphanages in Africa, and all of you here. So I'll, I'll leave it to this. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>